I'm Neil Dodgson, I'm the Professor of Computer Graphics in the Faculty of Engineering. And I'm Miriam Russ, I'm a Senior Lecturer in Film in the School of English Film, Theatre and Media Studies. We've got history going back to the 19th century of using stereoscopy to create 3D images and in some ways virtual reality carries on for some of the desires of this, even right now with virtual reality systems that are creating monoscopic displays, there's still a desire to create new types of realities around us with our visual systems and VR is just part of that. So I've looked at different technologies and I'm just interested in how they sink in with a lot of our cultural desires. Why do we as humans want to see something else in front of us and believe it's really in our space, this new thing? So um, I often come from a very um, cultural historical perspective, um, but hopefully also engage with mm. Neil's side of things, which is often the more technical. How can we actually get this to function? How do, how do these image systems work? There's been, since photography was invented, the, the capturing of reality in some way. And in fact, um, the Victorians built these things. So 3D stereoscopes is a very early version of virtual reality. You have two pictures, one for each eye, and you look in here and you see in 3D in a way that you can't see with a flat picture. And these were extraordinarily popular in the Victorian era. So there was this in the 19th century. Then there were these, um, the Viewmaster, which was very popular in the 1960s. And I remember having these as a kid and playing with them and looking through them, and it was a nice gimmick. And that's one of the things about the stereo stuff. It always seems to come across as being a gimmick. There was a very small spate of 3D movies in the 1920s. So before we could do sound in the movies, we could do 3D. And it turned out that this was not very popular with the public. It was the 3D done using the red-green glasses. And they very quickly discovered that this makes people feel ill. In the 50s, they used polarised glasses just as you would do in the movie theatres today. And that was cool new technology. And it worked really well in the movie studios when you had fresh film and you had a professional cinematographer running the two projectors, one for each eye. And it looked fantastic, just as it would today if you went to a digital 3D uh, cinema. But it completely flopped when it went out beyond those professional cinematographers out to the normal movie houses where the films broke. And so they were stitched together, which meant the two projectors were now out of sync. And if you're seeing your left and right eye slightly out of synchronization with each other, you get a headache within a minute. The interesting thing for me is that that cultural memory that 3D gives you a headache just lasted for decades. People had got stinking headaches from badly aligned movies in the 50s, and that was still touted as a problem, even once we got digital projectors with everything perfectly aligned. Um, but there was this real desire to do 3D, and they experimented, and the technology was cool and new, but it was a gimmick, and it died out very quickly. And VR is set up to be potentially the next step, which takes us beyond that gimmick. Um, but I think in some ways, VR carries on from 3D, that desire that humans have to be transported somewhere else. Mm. So the early stereoscopic images that went into these viewfinders were often spectacular locations. It was the Taj Mahal, it was the Egyptian pyramids. Um, so you could put on this, and it's a little bit like the VR headset. You put on the headset and you're transported to a different place visually, mm. but your mundane, boring world is closed off. Um, and that's what, cinema was doing, 2D cinema when it developed, was taking you to new worlds, taking you to new places, telling stories within them. But there was always that human idea that, well, if in the real world we have 3D experiences, we have depth planes, should that not be part of this experience? So um, even though 3D wasn't available in the movie theatres until the late 1910s, until the 20s, um, even as cinema was developing at the end of the 19th century, people were filing patents for 3D cinema. They didn't yet have the technology to make it work. There's an expectation that, well, if we can do stereoscopic vision with photography, why can't we do it with moving images? And VR, I think, is part of this ongoing trend, which is, okay, well, we can now do stereoscopic images, but what about the real world where, if we were to go to the Taj Mahal, we could look around in 360 degrees? So now this is kind of what VR is showing us. It's, okay, the next step, you don't just see uh, moving images, you don't just see colour, you can go to the place, you can see it all around you. I'd say with Avatar, 
in the um, on one side and with Up from Pixar on the other, those two movies had incredibly good stereographers working on them who made the 3D part of the storytelling toolkit, the same way color and sound and music are part of the storytelling toolkit. So we started to see that actually you could use 3D as part of the movie-making experience. It was no longer a gimmick, but unfortunately I think there's still quite a lot of people learning how to use 3D properly and doing it badly. Mm -hmm. Or doing it in ways that just don't add anything to the storytelling. And now we're back to that ground zero point with VR, where people are saying, well, how do we tell stories? Can we learn from what we learned with 3D cinema, which is that you don't just add it on mm. to the 2D experience. You have to create new storytelling tools, which as you pointed out, Avatar and Up were films that thought mm. about how can we do something that is effective in 3D that you'd maybe miss in 2D? Mm. What can we do in VR, which is specific to that environment? Um, and it's a really big crunch point that no one has really resolved yet. Well, I think we're in, in a world where us techie people are, are rather too enamored of the technology without thinking about the content. So, so in VR, it's really, really hard. To, how do you tell a story when the viewer can look wherever they like? We, we have a hundred years of working out how to tell stories that are framed, and now there's no frame. Mm -hmm. And there's this massive amount of experience directors have that doesn't work. Or we could modify, but how? And lots of people in Hollywood and elsewhere are trying to make this work. With a lot of money being thrown at this idea of how to create entertainment. Because in some ways, the other applications for virtual reality, um, gaming, health mm. applications, some tourist applications, mm. they are, they, they're, they're making sense, they're being worked through. Yeah. But how to tell stories, how to create entertainment that people will pay for yeah. in VR. Um, we've not yet had that avatar moment, that moment that makes the general member of the public who's not a gaming fan or doesn't have scientific applications, what makes them go and buy a headset? But my view is that that's not going to happen. When, when VR is going to stay niche because it requires you to lock yourself away from the real world. And unless you can actually bring the real world into the VR headset, there's going to be a big chunk of the population who will not put a headset on. Is it the chicken and egg scenario right now, though, where we're waiting for that breakthrough content that will open up to other audiences? Or do we have a scenario which we saw with 3D um, cinema, where there was resistance to the glasses? And it's been documented since the 1950s, public resistance. Um, and the reason I ask is that I've not yet seen the same type of news reports about VR headsets that we saw about 3D glasses. Because for every, when 3D cinema came back with the kind of digital boom with Avatar. For every newspaper article that said, this is the future, these movies are gonna make billions, there was always one article that said, but what about the glasses? Mm -hmm. Whereas I've not yet seen that with the VR, I've not seen too much resistance to the headset. So I don't know if that's because it's still too niche or because somehow we had a problem with 3D glasses and we don't have a problem with the big clunky thing that sits on top of your head. I can't imagine a killer app for a VR headset that would get 90% of the population wanting to engage with it. And that might mean I have a lack of imagination. <laughs> but can you see that a time could come where people would be perfectly happy to wear these things a couple of hours a day? It's a good question. I don't want to hedge my bets too much by saying, but I'm trying to imagine that we're having this conversation but at the turn of the century mm -hmm. when cinema was the new fad and people said, people won't want to go and sit in a dark room um, and watch these moving images. And then there was the explosion of cinema. So I don't know, I think I, I totally take on those points because I'm still waiting to see that, that one thing that connects people. When I was in the vibe, there was a point at which I suddenly realized that I didn't know where I was. I could ask the people around me to you know, re, you know, give me the bearings. Um, but what does that, does that you, does, what does that do fundamentally to you as a person to lose your spatial bearings, but then to still have them? Because I still had my feet on the ground. I still had a sense of space. Um, so it's exciting to think about the possibility of creative tools, but also to think about just what it does to us fundamentally as human bodies in space, because we're so used to being grounded in the world mm -hmm. and to having a sense of space. What happens when that shifts? And can we use it creatively? Or, or yeah, are we lost to something new? So I think there's already been some studies around 
can gaming and VR or other VR experiences help people that are normally socially isolated um, for various reasons, be it different types of disabilities or different types of social anxieties? Can VR open up interactivity for new people and so on? So it's a kind of, it's an interesting space to see these fears getting put out there, but also seeing how they might be resolved. So Miriam, I think that augmented reality with a headset mm -hmm. where we're going to see a big win here because there you've got a headset on but you can see the whole real world yeah. around you and the computer graphics is drawn on top of the real world mm -hmm. and i think that is something that could engage a vast majority of the population that you put on hopefully a fairly lightweight headset something that looks like a really cool pair of sunglasses mm -hmm. and it layers computer graphics on the real world <clears throat> and we know microsoft hololens and the magic leap are um two prototype products where they're trying to do this. So the problem of locking somebody away in a VR headset I think is always going to be a problem. But as soon as you can actually have that see-throughness, we'll start to see people actually wanting to wear these. It may become cool and trendy to have augmented reality sunglasses and to walk down the street and it guides you just by augmented arrows in your vision as to where you should be going. Ads can pop out from the shops as you go past them, trying to entice you inside. And so there's a whole, I know there's a whole bunch of technological problems that have to be solved by these companies to get a product that's really acceptable, which is why they've been announced, but very little details come out yet. It's actually really quite hard. I wonder though if there will still be something though about the switch off experience, because although I found the disorientation of space inside the headset, I can imagine though where getting used to it and creating your own little sanctuary <laughs> in the mm. world. Because in some ways I think that is where, even though movie theatre attendance has dramatically declined since its peak in the 20th century, I think there's still been something about those type of experiences where people get to enter a new space. And they, I think people actually do enjoy that you're meant to turn off your cell phones, you're not meant to talk to people around you. You, in our very, very busy world, now have a space that's uninterrupted and to maybe have that type of space created in VR. Now, how this can be fully uninterrupted in terms of having the kind of temporal limitation that the movie theatre has, which is no one's allowed to disturb you for the hour and a half, two hours mm. you're in there. How you'd create that in VR um, is a question, but I think there'll be some kind of desire about these, you know, taking you out of the world. And then if you can then participate in that world because you're not just watching an experience, you're not passively accepting, but you're interacting. I wonder if there'll be something there. And I think that might be part of our what's around the corner. Mm -hmm.